I'm very glad. Um, you were here for basic reasons. Because you wanted free dinner, obviously. Yeah. That was the reason we came. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, but tonight we're going to talk about uh, theology and textual criticism anyway, as Eric did. And uh, we have covered certain other views in the whole semester, pretty much until they gave my views, like them or not, they've gotten them. And um, so rather than me talk about your view, why don't yeah. you talk about your view? So Excellent. Right here. The other reason I, I have you here is because uh, I actually care quite a lot about how theology relates to textual criticism. Yeah. And I care a lot about theology in general, and so I appreciate that about you guys. Cool. So, Excellent. Well, thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Dr. Gurry, for having me here. And I really appreciate this opportunity, having me as a guest. Uh, this was a little bit more, uh, I think, informal than I planned for, but I'm just going to read from my, it always is. From, my, from my manuscript. And I'm just going to get through it and then write down questions you have, and we'll talk about them afterwards as opposed to interacting. And if there's an opportunity where you, know, you just can't help you have to interrupt, just let me know and we can maybe chat on something. Um, so in this lecture, I want to make it clear that my goal is not polemics. I, I don't want to, you know, cast you guys down as heretics or anything like that, or say you're not reading a Bible or, or anything of that nature. Um, my, time, my points may be polemic at times, um, just by the nature of the discussion itself. Uh, so hopefully no offense taken on either side. We're just, I think there's certain things that are sensitive. We're talking about the Word of God, and so there's obviously strong sentiments there. Um, so my intention is to be I ironic as possible and give you guys, as my brothers in Christ, the due Christian charity that is befitting of a sinner saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so I imagine if we're in this room, we believe that. And so that's, that's important that we conduct ourselves with that nature. So I expect you share the same testimony as me, and that's um, the grounds for, for Christian fellowship. And so that's where I'm coming from. Um, so the presentation is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be comprehensive. I'm not going to cover every single point. But I hope that at least to set forth my position dimly what others have set forth so brightly before, like Dean Bergen and, and Ledis and Hills. So um, the brief, the, the, I've been given the task of giving an overview of what has historically been called the ecclesiastical text by Theodore Ledis, uh, the traditional text by Dr. Dean Bergen or John Bergen. We talked about that a little earlier. Recently, it's been called by Robert Trulove. He's a pastor uh, called the canonical text. Um, by Dr. Jeff Riddle, it's been called the confessional text, and that's because he perceives, and, and I perceive, and Dane perceives it to be the position that if you are a adherent to a confession, this seems to be what the confession requires. Now, um, th with that being said, I'll, I'll add a little bit of a nuance there. Um, we, we don't say that you're not confessional if you read an ESV, right? Like, mm -hmm. like um, we don't necessarily say you must be King James or, or TR or whatever you want to call it. Um, so we just think that's the logical end of, of chapter one of the, of the 17th century confessions. So pejoratively, it's been called King James onlyism, TR onlyism, textual traditionalism by some. Uh, though um, Dr. Dirk Youngkind, he has used terms like uh, TR proponent. And so um, regardless of what you want to call it, the basic belief of the position is that the Masoretic Hebrew and Greek received texts are the texts that have been kept pure in all ages in the church and should be used for translation, as well as for uh, disputes, religious controversies, that the church should use them and appeal to them. Um, so I'm not offended whatever you want to call me, King James, whatever, TR, it doesn't matter to me, but uh, there is some nuance in, in the, the position and the names. We'll talk about that in a second. So um, there are minor variations within our camp. Um, we kind of mentioned them, I think, a little bit earlier uh, in your presentation, but um, some people sort of take a more of a corpus look at the TR. Like they'll take all the printed editions and they'll say that's the TR. And they'll, they'll say that, that some amount of textual criticism is, is warranted from that starting point. Mm -hmm. um, these are a lot of the kind of modern day followers of Dean Bergen uh, kind of go that route. And they'll take a text critical approach which takes a look at the TR as a starting point and then patristic evidence and then ancient versional evidence to kind of mm -hmm. Um, to put a holistic view together. So if the, if the text was available in the early church and the early versions and in the TR, then that, that bears witness to a consistent testimony. So that's 
some, and some people will say, okay, we're going to take the 1550 Stephanus as a base text. I believe uh, Pastor Doug Wilson kind of takes a sort of a view like that. Um, the, the other, um, really what this bull is down to is less than 10 places where the, the people in this camp differ from. Usually there's two that I see really hotly debated, like Ephesians 3.9 and Revelation 16.5. Um, those are the basic differences. So in terms of what people are, are disagreeing on, it's, it's a handful of places within our camp. Um, so the other group takes the underlying readings chosen by the King James translators, not by virtue of the translators themselves being inspired or specially moved along or anything like that, but because they claim, and we claim, that you can look back upon history and see that, that when those readings were selected, the church agreed upon them, they were used for theology, commentary, and so forth. So it's an, it's an argument from reception by the church. So despite the slight differences, all of those who advocate for the TR position, um, whether you want to call it the ecclesiastical text, confessional text, whatever you want to call it, all argue that the Masoretic text and the TR should be used um, for translation in matters of controversy. Um, they're, they're also typically in our camp against conjecturing, uh, amending the Masoretic Hebrew with versional readings, like the Syriac, the Old Vulgate, things like that. So we might take some issue with, for example, the ESV or something for some of the places that it conjectures from the old Vulgate or something like that. Um, so that, that's part of the reason why we, we tend towards the King James. So I don't really have time to go into the Masoretic text with the time that we have, so we're just going to stick, stick to the TR today. So I want to discuss three reasons tonight that I think um, I believe to be the most fundamental to understanding why someone might retain the traditional text of the Old and New Testament and thus Bibles translated from those texts. So I'm using the term traditional text to mean the Masoretic Hebrew and the received Greek text. We're just calling it the traditional text. Which while most people in this camp use the King James, there are also many that use the Geneva, the modern English version, the new King James version. So um, I, I don't properly call it King James onlyism at its fundamentals because you can, um, within our camp, there's, there's varied use of different translations. And in fact, some people still check um, the translation of the ESV, for example, and sermon preparation to see how other translators have rendered a certain word. So it's not like a dogmatic, if you're not reading the King James, you're not reading the Bible argument. Um, so many use these other versions. Uh, so I tend to avoid calling myself King James only because it's typically associated like with Ruckman and Gibb. Um, who don't necessarily aren't, weren't necessarily orthodox in a lot of other areas, and their view on the scripture was, is not something that we would align with. Um, we, we don't believe that the King James translators were specially moved along. We don't even believe that Siphonus or Beza or Erasmus were specially moved along. Um, there was nothing supernatural in the way that you know their, their pen didn't start moving, and, and you know they, there was nothing like that at play. We would say. And so we wouldn't call it King James onlyism. In any case, my feelings aren't hurt if you want to call me a King James onlyist. I'm not. I don't get too bummed out about that. So my three reasons: theological, personal, and pastoral. And these are the the three fundament, fundamentals, I believe, to why you would retain the 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 TR um, and the King James specifically. So before we get into it, um, what Bibles do you guys read? Like uh, I see an ESV on the table. What do you guys use in your daily reading? So you, you're so you're a you're a uh, so you're an NA onlyist, and a NA preferentialist. Nice. Okay. Do you you take the Tyndale House Greek text? Okay. Cool. I prefer the for the aesthetic value of it for reading. Oh, okay. Do you do like do you like the readings as well in that, or is it kind of? Yeah, I don't I don't have too many issues with it. Um, cool. I think that yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm working my way all the way through it. I've only started doing that since like last year, but nice. Um, yeah, I like this thing how you, when there are differences, I, I'll take a look at the DNA and see what the options are, but I don't find too much to disagree with at this point. Cool. And, and when you read in the English Bible, what do you, what do you take? ESV. ESV? Okay. So yeah. ESV, ESV. ESV. I mean, that's what I got right now, but cool. it used to be the NIV, so. Nice. Got it. And and, who, and then um, confessional, does anyone here say that they adhere to a confession at all? Just so I can kind of get a gauge where everyone's at. My churches. Your church's confession, okay. Apostle Creed. Creed, Creedal. Apostle Just the Apostle, not the Knight, okay. <laughs> I'm just going yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> No. Okay. So I personally, you know, tend to align with 1689, but I'm cool. not a part of a church that does that. So cool, okay. Finding one of those is... <laughs> 
Stephen Carpenter. Right, yes, definitely, that's, that's true. You know one. Yeah, 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 we, 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 we happen to this know one. This is actually the first place um, yeah. handle one. Yeah, so, <laughs> so we, we think that this view is, is quite appealing to those that are confessional because I think that the confession warrants um, this particular view on the text. Whether you land on the TR, I think the theological kernel um, uh, definitely pushes up against some of the, the axioms of modern textual criticism. And, and using that term just kind of broadly, um, the, the continued effort of constructing Greek texts. Um, so the first reason, and I think the most important reason, myself and others retain the traditional text is primarily on theological grounds. We readily admit that our position is not evidential or reconstructive. Right? We're not trying to craft a Bible. And that's, that's the, really the principal difference, um, I think, is that the basic premise is that the, fi the Bible never fell into such disarray that it required a reconstructive effort. Um, and that's, that's the general outlook of our position. So the, preser the preserved text was copied and transmitted in every generation, while hand copying was still the mode of transmission, and then continued to be preserved in printed copies when handwritten ink was retired for printed ink. Now, you, you guys might be red flags on, you know, bright lights screaming at me right now, but, that, but that's the general idea there, right? So um, from a manuscript perspective, the, the, the idea is that we, we typically don't accept a lot of the early texts as a part of that transmission stream. Now, that might sound weird to you, um, but, but that we generally take those as divergent as opposed to being a part of the, the, the river, so to speak. And so we've talked tonight a little bit about, oh, were there two streams that, that kind of converged? Did one grow, grow from the other? Um, there's a lot of different ways you kind of get to the majority, the Byzantine tradition, right? And I think um, one, one, of the, one of the things that I, I have pushed at some of my critical text friends at is I think that that, that that area is rather gray in history, and I don't think we can speak super confidently about the early church based on what we have with manuscripts. I think it's very, it's very gray in certain areas. And we've you know, described it as kind of the blurry forest or, or and that sort of idea. And so to a certain degree, we're all kind of conjecturing what exactly happened from the time um, that we see our first manuscripts into the, Byz the Byzantine tradition. Um, so the question that I think one has to answer on theological grounds is not why is the TR God's word and why are you wrong, right? You know, we're not, we're not answering that question. We're answering which text tells the story of being transmitted and delivered to the church in every generation. And that's, I think, no matter what, what, what view of the text you hold, that's the one I think we, we, we have to answer. We have to keep into consideration um, how is God speaking to his people today? And we, I think, all in this room would accept through God's word is, is, the, is the, the way that he speaks today. So Doug Wilson, um, though I don't agree with him everywhere theologically, I think he asked a really important question in his written dialogue with, with James White. Um, he, he framed the discussion in this way. He said, in other words, is the Bible preserved or is it not? And that's kind of how he framed it. And, and so some people might take a look at that and say, well, I'm not sure that's a fair question, right? Because everyone would agree here that the Bible is preserved. Now, we have to actually substantiate that, though. Does the story we tell about the Bible speak to a, pres a preserved text, or does it speak to a quasi-preserved text, as the word that we used earlier? You know, it, what are, how are we defining preserved? Um, and, and now we've got um, new terms that are kind of being introduced that are not theologically in history, like the initial text. How do we deal with the definition of the initial text when historically we've dealt with either authorial or original? Or, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to define terms. Now I'd say the discussion is, is, is shifting a little bit in terms of definitions right now. And so all of our creedal, all of our confessional, all of our doctrinal statements are all geared around this idea of the original text when the ECM is claiming to not necessarily have the original text, though I've um, heard Dr. Gurry say, well, we don't have any reason to say that the initial and the original are not the same thing. Um, so, so that discussion is still very much so ongoing right now, and I think we all have to admit that. So this is why those that advocate for the traditional text of the Old and New Testament typically reject the current effort of textual scholarship. They're, they look at the evidence, they look at the methods, and they say, we don't think that it can do what we need it to do as believers. And so the extant evidence can only speak to what is available in this generation. 
And typically, printed texts are not considered as a part of the story of transmission, at least in our, our effort with the ECM work. We're mostly looking at the first thousand years for the most part. Though, as I was talking with Dr. Gurley, or Gurley earlier, um, they do consider later manuscripts as well, but there's really only a guarantee for those first thousand years. So the evidence that is used is the manuscripts we have prior to 1000 AD for the most part, and we have very little insight as to who created a lot of those, for what purpose, and how they were used. And this is the really, the really big million dollar question. When we look at a manuscript and we don't know who made it, we don't know for what purpose or who used it, how, are we, how can we determine that those readings were orthodox and came from an unauthentic uh, uh, archetype? And so we have to think about these sorts of things. And so further, we have no way of verifying that the readings we have selected from these manuscripts um, are, or perhaps original, since we have no original text to check our work against. And this is really where we, I think we talked about a little bit earlier, um, this idea of uncertainty and certainty and how much certainty can we have, how much is warranted to have. This is the idea here. You know, are we warranted for saying this reading is original? And so what I typically argue for is that in the 21st century, we have the least amount of perspective on our surviving handwritten manuscripts, because at this point, we're the furthest away from when those manuscripts were actually used in churches. There was uh, probably a dialogue going on, you know, which manuscripts are authentic, which ones came from where. And in a lot of ways, we don't exactly know where these things came from. Or um, if we do, we've somehow lost some of them in some cases. And uh, in, in um, the most recent book by Dr. Gurry and Dr. Hickson, um, what did they say, about 500 or so manuscripts that could potentially still be found um, out of the ones that exist. And so there's a certain level of, of the manuscripts we have may not represent the whole story, and even the whole story we have, how can we be sure that we've got the, the right thing? How can we be sure what, that we're there with our methods that we've chosen? Right? This is outside of the context of we all believe that God's word has been preserved. It's been kept pure. Now the question is, can our methods show that? When, when we talk about the method that we have selected for ourselves, can we be confident in that method itself? And so that means despite all of our modern evidence and methods, we, we simply cannot have the kind of perspective that the church had when handwritten manuscripts were actually being used in churches. And I think this is possibly something that we need to be a little bit humble about in terms of what we do know. And, and I, um, I really did appreciate Jim Royce's work on the scribal habits and kind of changing that perspective. And I generally take the perspective, I think that, that, our, that the, copy, the scribes were way more careful than, than, than you read in, in some of the older works and things of that nature. So the theological underpinning then is the best evidence I would say that we have for the fact that God originally inspired the text and the text that we have today is that very text. So not necessarily which hand copied texts and virginal evidence simply survived in a modernity. And that's a big point. I, I, think, I think that just because something is surviving doesn't make it good or best. And we all know this. There's some pretty wonky manuscripts out there. We were talking about Codex Beze a little bit earlier. Um, so perhaps the strongest motivation for at least exploring this view on the text is the fact that you cannot responsibly maintain absolute certainty. And there's that word that, that I think everyone probably wants to talk about is, you know, should we have absolute certainty on every word that is in your Bible based on the principles that we've chosen? Right? Can the method that we, and that's the really big nuance there, right? Is the method that we have chosen, can it give us the kind of certainty that we need? So this becomes problematic when you actually go to read, to read God's word. You know, you might say, well, nobody expects that kind of certainty, right? No one's ever had that kind of certainty. But I imagine when you read your Bible, you do believe you're reading the word of God, right? And, and I can uh, certainly assure you, and if you've ever met a Christian, they believe they're reading the word of God when they open the pages of whatever version they're reading. Now, whether they're warranted in looking, let's just say, the passion translation or the message, whether or not they're actually doing that. But I think everybody to everybody who is a, a believer um, who has been saved, genuinely, they open their Bible and they are reading God's word. And so we, we don't we're not consistent here. We're not consistent between our text critical theology, so to speak, and our practical theology, where we say, you know, I don't know if I can have absolute certainty on Luke 23, 34. But when I read my Bible, I am certain that I'm reading God's word. And so you might, you know, maybe throw out something in that case or, or have that maybe an asterisk in the back of your head there. But when we read God's word devotionally, um, 
I'm a firm believer that we shouldn't be reading it critically in terms of judging the, God, um, the word of God. We should be reading it and letting the word of God judge us. And this is more of a, a pastoral practical application there. But if you don't believe that what you're reading with absolute certainty is God's word, what is it do we believe that we're reading then? And I think that's an important question to consider. If we're not absolutely certain, what exactly is it that we're reading and why is it in our Bible? And so the day, and, and this is something um, that, that as a pastor, the day I tell my people that we can't have certainty on the word of God, that's the day that I, I put aside my, my robes and my, my collar, right? I think that as, as, first of all, Christians, and second of all, pastors, we have an obligation and a duty to give people confidence that God is speaking to them in his word. And so we have to be very careful, and, and that's why I appreciate um, the effort of, of, of Dr. Youngkind and yourself and, and Dr. Hickson. I think the heart behind everything that you guys are doing is, is to do just that. And so I really do appreciate that, as opposed to maybe a D.C. Parker or an Eldon Epp, who's very, very, very skeptical in terms of what the Word of God is. Um, and so there's certainly, uh, I, I'm appreciative of that. So... There are two principal texts we've talked about already today a little bit that are used in the Protestant confessions of the 17th century are 2 Timothy 3.16 and Matthew 5.18. And so the basic premise of reception over reconstruction, so there's two ideas here, reception over reconstruction, comes from the confessional language kept pure in all ages. So I don't exactly have time tonight to present a seminar exegeting the Greek but I can tell you the exegetical conclusions that underpin this view from these two texts. And so there's a book I think that Dr. Gurry has in the syllabus for this class called Has the Bible Been Kept Pure? Um, I believe you put that in there. That, that if you guys have read that or are interested in that, that those two texts kind of being brought out and explored historically, mm -hmm. that book is an excellent uh, survey of, of that. Um, so this, I'm taking this proposition then, which is basically a conclusion from these two texts from this book. And the reason I chose this book is because I believe everyone here can perhaps get behind it, at least in principle. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a TR only piece of material, right? You know, so the major premise is this. One, God has given his people by inspiration all the words of the Bible. And that's kind of taken from 2 Timothy 3.16, Pasagraphi um, Theopnevstone. Um, so... Point two, all God's words are necessary for God's people for all time. So in every generation, that's kind of drawn out from Matthew 5.18. Three, therefore, God has preserved all the words of the Bible for all time. So that's from page 22 of Richard Brash's booklet, How God Preserved the Bible, which I have used because I believe it represents the theological position that most conservative evangelicals hold to. So the real question seems to be for most people, which text is it that God preserved? Which text is it? And that's a strange question, I think, for, for maybe some of us in this room, because we think, well, well, what does that mean, the text? What does it mean, which text? You know, we're talking about, most of the time, texts. We're talking about different printed texts. What is scripture? Is it sort of a big, ethereal concept, or is it an actual material thing? Kind of that idea we touched on a little bit earlier. Um, so there are three theological concepts built on these exegetical principles that I believe lead to adopting the traditional text then, assuming we're fine with that three-point proposition that I just gave. The first is that the Bible has been preserved both in matter and in sense. So both the material, the words, and the doctrines, the sense. And we'll talk about that in a second. Two, the preserved text has been given to God's people fully. So we would say that, that, that there, there isn't a part of God's word that has fallen away, and there isn't a part of God's word that we don't have or don't know. And the final is that the scriptures are self-authenticating. And this is a, an idea that, that is especially built out in the Protestant Reformation in a pretty large way. So doctrinally speaking, I would say that, that for the most part, you, you probably could affirm most of what I just said. But it needs to be nuanced a little bit. And, and what's typically set forth, especially by the Chicago Statement and, and statements similar to that, um, as it pertains to preservation, it's, it's a little bit different in three different ways. So our, in our position, we affirm material preservation, meaning that the words themselves have been preserved, not just the doctrines or the sense. So when you, I, I think that the reason that, that, that that's important, I think, is if you have uncertainty on words, you can still say, well, the doctrine has been maintained, and therefore the, the fact that the material has fallen away isn't that big of a deal. Uh, we can still maintain preservation of the sense of the thing. So the, one of the problems I have with this idea that, that the, the sense can be preserved without the material 
is, is, is that um, the idea that the sense can be preserved despite the material being variable or uncertain is that the sense of a text is always gathered from the matter. The, the sense of the text is always gathered from the matter. So if the matter changes, the sense changes. Now, obviously, not in every case. You talk about spelling, talk about a K or a the, right? You, you mentioned a little bit earlier, and, but, and. You know, there, there's certain words that, that kind of work interchangeably, so we're not talking about those. We're talking about material changes that do matter. Um, and so while this idea that no doctrine is effective may be very comforting to us, I, I don't think that it can be substantiated when you look at the material differences between the two texts. Now that obviously, maybe we can talk about that a little bit afterwards, um, and, and perhaps um, exploring the chapter in your book might, might also be enlightening. Um, so I believe personally that I, I don't think that it can be responsibly maintained that no doctrine is changed. I think that doctrine can be changed and is changed, especially Con, you know, considering that you look at the New World Translation, for example, there's a certain, there's specific reasons, they don't change a whole lot, but where they do, it certainly does change doctrine. And so I think in a certain sense, responsibly, we have to say, okay, a word can definitely change the meaning. It can and it does change the meaning. So I, I believe there are important differences, and those differences do change doctrine. So if the, the, the basic idea is that the Bible is not material, materially preserved, the Bible can't be preserved in doctrine, or it can't be preserved in sense. And so at that point, we must say, well, it's quasi-preserved, or substantially pure, or partially preserved. And then you have to dive into, and I think the biggest problem, practically speaking, the endless task of determining which words are pure, which are not. And as far as I'm concerned, no one has actually done this yet. No one has created sort of a, a list of how important these words are, which ones do we care about, which ones don't we care about. Um, and, and, and so more on that in a second. But the second idea is that it affirms our position that the preserved text is available today in full. And the people of God can actually know which text it is that is preserved. And that, that the text that, the idea there is that my sheep hear my voice. That the Holy Spirit does testify in the believer that he's reading the word of God. Now that's not, that sounds similar to the Mormon doctrine, that sounds similar to neo-orthodoxy, but it's not. And it's a fully built out and foundational doctrine of the Protestant Reformation. It was actually the Protestants' chief defense against Rome when they were talking about the authority of the scriptures and who gives it to it. So this is different than most articulations of the doctrine of scripture in that most evangelicals who are clued onto the conversation, at least, clued in on, may say they, that we don't know exactly what the prophets and the apostles wrote, though it's out there somewhere, right? We may not know exactly what they wrote, but we know we have it. We're just not sure what it is yet. We have a pretty good idea, though, good enough. That's essentially the idea, right? And this is the general idea behind, I think, Dan Wallace's proof where he draws that spectrum we talked about earlier between radical skepticism and absolute certainty. The major issue I have with this proof, in my opinion, is that I do not find any good reason to believe that we actually do know what the prophets and apostles said in any place if we assume that we don't know what they said in some places because, and this is important, we, we touched on this idea earlier, but the reason I think we can't know is because the same methodology is used in both places. Right, so, so at, at some point we're saying we just have determined with this methodology that this is more certain than that. Are you, you saying it's arbitrary? Or are you saying the method itself is flawed? I'm saying that the method itself cannot produce the kind of certainty that we want it to in any place if it can't, pre and if it can't preserve pre or do that at every place. Now, wow. obviously, um, the reason I'm saying that is because there's not any special power where the method, or not threshold that says, once we get past this level of confidence, we know it's original. There's still that 10%, and no matter if it's just a slam dunk, even if every single manuscript that we have reads this one way, no tech, place of zero textual variation, you're like, whoa, that's weird. So you're saying 1% of uncertainty in your view is hundred percent uncertainty? Not necessarily in the way it works itself out. But, but what I'm saying in the methodology, in principally, principally because... But why not in practice? Because if the principle is true, then shouldn't the practice... Well, because no one reads their Bible like a text critic. I think that's the major thing that I... That, uh, that's it. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe that's the case. Maybe that's the Part case. Of me. <laughs> so the, the, ba the basic idea is that you, you don't have a, a point of comparison, right? So you can be, you can be varying... You what. No, I don't either. That's why, yeah, right. So we're not, no one's claiming to have the original, right? No one's claiming to have an archetype. No one's claiming to have the, the, the original text, right? Is that original the thing that all of us need to have certainty? Um, no. It depends on what, how you define original, I think. We'll talk about that in a second. Whether, if we're calling the original the text well, we the have. The thing that none of us have is right. not the thing that any of 
the yeah. actual autograph. Yeah. 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 No one needs the no one needs the autograph, or God would have preserved the autograph. Right. That's kind of I the see. idea. You're yeah. assuming we need certainty. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Keep yep. Going. Yep. Okay. So, um, this is essentially, and this is I've gotten a lot of critique for presenting this idea, because this is essentially Dr. Bart Ehrman's response to Wallace. Right. And so I, I don't find any joy in agreeing with Bert, with Bart Ehrman at all. Right. None of us do. I would imagine. Um, in, 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 in his critiques of Christianity and the scriptures, right? So, on that one, I don't. Right. right. So, um, but, but I think he's actually correct in here. And I think that um, a lot of people have spent a lot of time discrediting Ehrman's credentials and his actual authority that he does have in this industry and this discipline. And I, I think that he, he definitely does have some clout. He, he has definitely done the work. And I think... He is certainly an authority that can be trusted in his determinations, at least when he's doing text criticism and not popular level stuff. So I, I think that, that I, I, I do think that he's correct, not by virtue of him being Bart Ehrman, but by virtue of him being correct. Um, so basically the, 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 where this boils down to is that if the Bible that we kind of inherited from the Reformation period um, is not pure, is not preserved, then the reconstruction effort, I argue, is hanging three feet in midair. So if the Bible that we inherited is wrong, then we have no point of, con of comparison for the reconstruction effort. And so there's always going to be either a changing text or an uncertain text to a certain degree of uncertainty. Um, unless, of course, the CBGM becomes an AI and we can maybe somehow, you know, who knows? So if we take the supremacy of the, of the early surviving texts, then we introduce, I say, a new problem that wasn't there before. We introduce the problem into our reconstruction effort in that we likely will never be able to do it. And in that sense, I'm in line with Epp and Parker on that point. Um, so an important question to ask, I believe, is that is a reconstruction effort justified? And this was essentially Dr. Bergen's point. He said, I don't think we should be able to, I don't think that an effort is justified with the material that we have. And he did a very, very, very intense and thorough inspection of these texts, him and Hoskier. And they come to the conclusion, well, Bergen in his, in his Bergeny way says, if we were trying to reconstruct Shakespeare with this kind of text, we wouldn't have Shakespeare today. And so that, that's, that's the idea there. Um, is that your position as well? Uh, that, that the reconstruction effort is... That we don't have enough to do it. Um, I think the, I, I'm still out on it, okay. but I generally tend to agree with that premise, that, that I'm, not sure, I'm not sure. What would we need in your mind? Probably more. We, we, would probably, more. Need, we would probably need more early texts. I don't think we have enough. Yeah. So if we have more early texts than Bergen had, way more, mm -hmm. but we still need more. No, well, okay, so if you, if you were to take the, what we have, I'm not, even, I'm not saying compared to Bergen. I'm just saying in general of what we do have. But we have way better than Bergen has, is what I'm saying. That's possible, yeah. It, it could no, be possible. Sure, it's true. It's true. Sure, okay. Like we have yeah. way more early papyri than he had. He had, like, no papyri. Well, then you have to talk about, or did the papyri, were they important? And you have to talk about that whole discussion, which maybe we can talk about after, okay. the importance of the papyri. But, um, but that leads us to the third difference. Though I imagine many of you would agree with the general principles that I just laid out, that the scripture, or this principle, sorry, that the scriptures are self-authenticating. And that the second that you apply an external authority to authenticate the word of God, it's not God's word. We, we, it, it, it no longer has any sort of authority on its own. We give it authority. So it becomes the word of God in some way or another. So what I argue is that the scriptures cannot be self-authenticating. So if you hold to the text as being self-authenticating, I argue that you cannot sustain this notion if the texts derive their authority externally if the consent of textual scholarship or the Church of Rome or any other authority or us, if our textual decisions make something scripture, I do not, I hold that you cannot sustain this idea of a self-authenticating text. The text is given or imbued authority by some other means. So when the text, for example, is split in the ECM, it's difficult to argue that the text is self-authenticating when we're sitting here and we come to independent conclusions as every other person that is now making independent decisions on the text. And so I think this is a significant theological problem that probably everyone has to think about, um, regardless of where you fall on it. When you're making a textual decision, who's in, it, who's in charge of that decision at that point? So Warfield kind of approached this dilemma 
And obviously, Warfield was in a very different context than we are today in terms of where text criticism has gotten to. We, we would all admit that, that text criticism has definitely grown and changed a bit. But he handles this dilemma by saying that the efforts of text critics of his time were the instrument of God's preserving work. And that view is still pretty much largely held today, for the most part. If you take a look at Lethem's Systematic Theology, which just came out, um, he represents a pretty conservative, you know, um, that's basically the view he takes. And so I would say that he's a good gauge. So I think it safely is to say that, I mean, if, if you're going to take a providential view, you have to say that the modern effort is some sort of providential work today, right? That's the general idea. The issue I have with this, and this is more of a hypothetical, but I, 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 I do not believe that Warfield was expecting that the text would still be working, being worked on today. Um, I think he believed it would be finished. I think he believed it would be finished. Like, because the previous effort came to a close. Whether you like their product or not, it came to a close. Not to say that text criticism just stopped happening, right? He's very confident. Yeah, He's right. Very optimistic. He's yeah, right. So all that to say that the current that if the current text effort of textual scholarship, um, which kind of goes back to, I would say, when I say modern scholarship, back to the publication of all F and B. That's, that's where I'm saying modern scholarship started. Um, whether you want to disagree with that definition, that's how I'm defining it. Um, if that's the providential word of God, you have to come to terms with the fact that it has not produced a certain text, and we don't have something that we can put our hands on that is stable yet. Now, the goal is that by the time the ECM is done, we can get there, right? That's the, that's the optimistic outlook, is that we get to a stable text, but we don't have it yet. So the general response to this question that I just asked is typically that God doesn't desire us to have the full thing, right? That's typically how it's handled. So we shouldn't assume a perfect text when God himself doesn't assume that we should have his perfect text. So th this seems to be sort of the idea of Dr. Youngkind and Dr. Hickson. Um, with as much grace as I can possibly demonstrate to them, I, 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 I'm going to disagree with them here. I think this view is incorrect, and I do not believe it can be demonstrated anywhere in the scriptures that we should have uncertainty about the text. Um, the scriptures present a view that the word of God is pure, perfect, that we should delight in it, be comforted by it, believe every word that proceeded forth from the mouth of God. And so in whatever form God words, God's word exists, that should be a certain form. And that's the general idea that we're talking. So I think certainty is warranted from scripture. And in the other sense, I don't think uncertainty is warranted from the scriptures. So all that said, I believe the scriptural testimony is very clear about these principles. I do not think the Bible gives us any warrant that we should be uncertain about the words or that God desires his people to approach the word of God as skeptics. Can, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Okay. Do you think the Bible ever um, gives us more to be uncertain about its meaning? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, well, in a certain sense, I, th I think that, that uh, exegesis is also important. Like, I'm not, you know, like we, we don't just have God's word and know what it means. I think we also have to read it as believers and faithfully interpret that word sure. as well. But you yeah. said that, like, Second Peter says, there are certain things that Paul really oh, yeah. hard to understand. Well said. Yeah. Well, it says that, and I, I, well, so I take a view, I don't think he was saying that that means that we can't determine what the word of no, God says. Right, yeah, but yeah. There are some things that are harder than others. Sure, yeah, of course. So it's, scripture is not a sort of a yeah, like, 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 what does it mean when, when Jesus, you know, when, when Jesus descends down to the souls in prison? What, what do we make of that? That's a very hard passage to interpret. Okay, so if you have a hard yeah. passage to interpret, why can't there be hard passages to determine the text about? Because I don't why think that it's, I don't think it's our job to determine what the text is. But it's our job to determine what it means. Yes. In, in, in a, uh, yes, yeah, so, so maybe whether you take that as inconsistent or not. I, I think the text has ontological meaning, if that makes sense. It has real, it has real meaning. Well, and it has yeah. ontological existence. I mean, yeah, exactly, yeah. The inspired text of Scripture is the inspired text of Scripture. Whether, yeah, right. You know, whether and so, have it here or not. Right. And so your basic premise is that it ontologically exists, but we, we, we haven't fully gathered all the pieces yet, or perhaps... Well, I don't know. Okay, got maybe it. Maybe we have. Okay, got it. Okay. That, that makes sense. So, okay. Okay. so basically I'm taking a position here that, that we should be certain about the words we have. Um, and so I don't think God desires his people to be skeptics when it comes to reading his word and to fellowshipping with him in the scriptures. So there are three principles that I affirm that undergird the reception of the traditional text in, its, um, in itself. I believe, one, that the Bible will be material, materially preserved, not just the doctrines, until all is fulfilled, because that is the way he speaks to, saves, and sanctifies his people by the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that it is in line with his covenant purpose, which is what is being fulfilled in Matthew 5.18. 
the way that he accomplishes that purpose is through the scriptures by the power of the Holy Spirit in time, in the, the last days. And, Can I ask yeah, go for it. Uh, but he does that through the ESV and the King yeah, I would say I would say so. That's a that's an interesting question. Maybe let's talk about that after. But I wouldn't say that because I my first Bible was the NIV, yeah. and so I, I would, so I, I would say like oh I wasn't saved until I read a King James, right? right? I would never say that. So um, we maybe round talk that up. But no, I'm not saying like, if you're reading an ESV, you're not reading the word. The ESV is is based on different Greek text than the text. Right. I would say where they disagree with the traditional text, then it's if it's an, an error. Right. Yeah. But God but still God saves people through, through that error. His error through the error. It's a good question. I'm not sure if I have an omni, omniscient answer to that question. Um, but he did say he used the NIV, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So he yeah, but the, yeah. The, the entire NIV is not errant, though. Ah, okay. okay. Right, exactly. So we're talking about where there's, there's significant right. doctrinal errors. Right. In other words, the Bible doesn't things. have to be materially perfect. No, it right. still be used the way you're saying it. Right. right, and, and we, yeah. ancient church, and, and, and I think um, maybe maybe uh, it was maybe Douglas Wilson who said this, but God strikes straight blows with crooked sticks. I mean, many people have said that, but yeah, right. in, in terms of the text. So, so in terms of, of uh, what's at stake here, I, I don't think that we're, we're talking about if you're not reading a King James, you're not saved. I'm not, you know, you can't do evangelism with an ESV. Right, right. Um, I read the ESV for, I think, five or six years every day. So, so can you just so read again what you just had? Yeah, so I believe that the, my, the Bible will be materially preserved until all is fulfilled yeah. because that is the way he speaks to, saves, and sanctifies his people by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. But well, he doesn't have to do that perfectly to do those things. He, he, he does it perfectly in that he saves us perfectly. Yeah, yeah, but he doesn't yeah. have to materially yeah. preserve the Bible perfectly in order to perfectly save I mean, us. somebody can paraphrase hmm. the gospel message. Right. And well, and that's the, the spoken word of God is, is equally the, in terms of power, right? That faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So we wouldn't say that someone needs to be reading the exact words. Okay. So, okay. yeah, right. right. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, sorry. And that maybe, maybe write that as a note and we can maybe circle back on that later um, after uh, we're done here. Um, so secondly, the Bible will be given to God's people and they will know what that word is until all is fulfilled. And that's sort of the... the um, the big the big thing that needs to be nuanced, and so I'm going to use some generalizations here because uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, but um, the, the doctrinal point that I'm talking about is typically called exposure. Uh, theologians like Michael Kruger have used this term. Um, Dr. Gurry and I have discussed this briefly, but it does not mean that every single church or every single believer has had exposure to God's word at all times in history. Um, if this were the case, then we would say that the Bible wasn't preserved by virtue of the fact that the persecuted church in Iran or in China doesn't have a Bible. So simply because the Bible's not in the hands of every person, every believer at all times doesn't make it not preserved. And so we have to ask, what does it mean when we say that the church has had it or the believing people of God have had it? What do we mean by that? I believe that it means that the, that the people of God involved in copying, transmitting, preaching the text in time had access to the authentic copies in every generation. That doesn't mean that every single one of them did. We know that there are manuscripts that people used, for example, or some of Origen's manuscripts have interesting readings in them, right? But it always did exist at, some, at every point. Did mm -hmm. they yeah. always, did someone always know that it existed? I think so. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. I'm going to discuss historical kind of connects here in a second. And maybe, that's probably where you guys are going to have the most hands coming up, but, but we'll try to get through it. Anyway. What this means is that the people of God involved in copying and transmitting and preaching the text had access to the authentic copies in every generation generally. So in other words, God has exposed his word to accomplish his covenant purpose of giving his people his word so that he can accomplish his purpose of saving people by that word. So as you know, the idea of having a complete Bible is a concept that we probably take for granted. That's something that is pretty new to modernity for us to have goat skin Bibles and leather Bibles and electronic Bibles and all of that. Though my, my argument that I'm going to make from history is I think the early church had way more access to Bibles than perhaps we think. It is difficult to determine how much access the early church had to Bibles today due to the fact that so many were destroyed, particularly during the Diocletian persecution, and the fact that a lot of early Bibles were written on bioorganic material that deteriorated. Um, the, your book says up to 500 years, and that's given, that's conservative, you know, probably more like 100 years, right? Um, so in any case, the earliest manuscripts well, probably wouldn't have lived all that long, right? Some of them survived for 2,000 years. Oh, yeah, that's a question that I have for you, how that's possible. We'll maybe talk about that later. But the, the number that they give is basically 100 on the lower side, 500 on the upper side, yeah, generally that's, speaking. Yeah, and that's the, the problem is we know for a fact that many of them survived for over 1,000 years. 
Because we have them. <laughs> right, exactly. Preposterous. Of course they're Forgeries. <laughs> So with, with these, and then finally the third point, the scriptures derive their authority from God himself and are self-authenticating. We don't give the Bible its authority. So with these three principles in mind, I want to present a case from history that I think leads to the adoption of the traditional text. So my whole presentation here is why in the heck would someone like me read a King James, right? Like why are we, how do we get there? So currently the, there are many narratives of transmission of the scriptures in the early church. Um, but, but a very common one I'm sure you guys are familiar with is that the copying of the scriptures quickly became decentralized. And that's sort of how we have this idea of multiple text streams that are popping up in different places and explain how our so-called Alexandrian texts are different from our later so-called Byzantine texts, um, that there was multiple sort of things going on here. Um, I want to challenge this. And this, this idea uh, uh, kind of comes from Dr. Jeff Riddle, a presentation he gave at the Texan Canon Conference. But I want to challenge this notion primarily due to what we know about book creation in the second and third century. We know that oftentimes writers would save their original copy for their records, especially just in secular writings. They would keep a copy for themselves um, so they could either recopy it or prove, hey, no, this is my work. Um, and that the initial copies of their work that circulated oftentimes were copies that they had made and proved with the scribes themselves and circulated out. So we know... Um, so we know that we, so I argue that biblical writers would not have deviated from this practice. I think that this probably would have been something that Paul, I, in other words, I don't think Paul would have sent the, the authorial text off to Corinth or Ephesus. I think that would have been probably kind of foolish on Paul's behalf. And then trusted that it was going to get there on time and be copied. I think he probably made copies and sent them out together, which explains why we have a lost letter to the Laodiceans, which could have just been Ephesians. Right? It was just the same thing that got lost on some, in some way. So obviously there, there could be a conversation there, but I'm just going to keep going because that's what I'm presuming here. Further, and this is where I'm going to push against Dr. Youngkin's idea. We know that the Jews kept their scriptures in the temple and that Jewish scribes were converted as recorded in Acts. Dr. Youngkin argues that no such mechanism existed or was transferred from Jewish practice to Christian practice. That's his idea of decentralization there. However, I believe we do see similar practices adopted by the early church in the apostolic churches. In fact, we see early writings, and I can get those sources to you guys later if you're interested in them, um, which testify to the apostolic churches as maintaining these practices, that you could go to Corinth or Ephesus or Rome and compare your copy against the ancient records or hear the, the scriptures read. In fact, Are you, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, mm -hmm. are you yeah. citing, uh, I believe that's Irenaeus yes. and the Craig Evans work? Uh, yes, no. that is correct. Okay. Yeah. Are you aware that Craig Evans didn't have that peer review? Um, not aware, not aware. But you can you send me the the maybe problems with it? Yeah, thank you. So assuming that that that, that this practice was can be confirmed, assuming that that the that the Jewish practice of storing the scriptures in the temple or in the apostolic churches existed, which I think it does, it explains how we end up do having a uniform text and a lot of scriptures being produced. At least even, even in the fact that the Alexandrian text agrees so much with the Byzantine text, I think demonstrates that the process wasn't entirely decentralized. So that's, that's, that's I think, a generally safe thing to say, though I, I, I imagine that you could probably make a case against it, though I'm not sure why you would want to do that. So I can test the notion of a decentralized transmission process in the early church. Further, we know, um, which is detailed in the Dr. Gurry and Dr. Hickson's new book, that plagiarism was discussed in ancient times. And in fact, according... Um, to that work, it was pretty easy to, to determine if something had been plagiarized or changed. Um, they, they cared a lot about the, their, their name, their reputation, and their source of income. And so if we assume that the early Christians had just as much care for their Bible as, let's just say, Quintilian had for his writings, then I think we can assume that texts not written with apostolic authority would have been identified and called out and not copied anymore. Now, obviously, we can't prove that. We obviously cannot prove that, but I think it's safe to say that at least there would have been discussion about it. And in fact, we do see discussion by, um, by Jerome and Eusebius and Augustine about certain texts that were being either unfaithfully transmitted or thrown out in their words. So this means that a divergent text stream, I think, would have been able to be identified, which puts the idea to rest that the church would have been comfortable with two text streams. I don't think the early church would have been comfortable saying, well, we have some scriptures with the ending of Mark and some without it. I don't think that would have been something that they would have been okay with. So to take a different spin on a quote from, this, from um, the Myths and Mistakes book from page 45, 
Quote, one must also remember that many of these New Testament manuscripts discovered in the sands of Egypt were cast aside in the trash heaps of Oxyrhynchus. I argue that they were there not because they were done being used by being used a lot. I argue that they were there because they were trash. And that's the general idea, and obviously we can't confirm either or, but I do think that something that both that ends up in a trash can ended up in a trash can for a reason. Yeah, so I'm going to assume a couple of, now quickly on that, that doesn't mean that every reading in those manuscripts was bad or wrong or not original, right? That just means that they, they generally were not of quality enough to be maintained and preserved or copied. Is it your presumption then hmm. that uh, the earliest church would have a view of the originals or the earlier text as we would like to have it today as in something that should be kept holy and protected? I think they believed it to be received. We see that in the early church now that they kind of use the term canon and scriptures interchangeably, which has caused confusion. Is, yeah, the impression, I mean, do you the impression that once a text was copied, that that source text, the basics mm. they used, would then be protected rather than discarded? Um, some people, I mean, I think we see that, that there were practices in the East where they destroyed some of their manuscripts when they were done being copied, though I've heard that that's been kind of contested recently. But the... Um, I think in any case, we don't have a whole lot of information on how they copied their text in the early church. Do you think... Uh, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. You're great. All right. So uh, you're saying, hey, look, these papyri were kind of trash dumps. Yeah. Ago. They, they, they could have been trash. Could have been trash. Yeah. Uh, logically, then, does that imply that the papyrus that we have that was not kind of trash dumps is therefore there were not regarded? Not necessarily. Oh, um, still might have been regarded as... Could, could, could have been regarded as not good, could have been regarded... I think the, the, the best indication, I think, and obviously speaking as not a textual scholar here, sure. I think a good indication that something was valuable is if we see the reading later. If it was preserved in the actual used manuscripts that were being used. I think the that's... The text of the manuscript. The text of the manuscript, not the actual well, manuscript. Well, most of the manuscripts share, you know, 80%. Right, yeah, right, 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 so... So, I mean, when it comes down to the nuance, we're really talking of places of significant textual variation that matter. But it's, okay. um, but maybe we can get to that. Okay. Later. Yeah, yeah, let me, yeah, we, we've got a lot, a lot of stuff here. And then okay. yeah, hopefully you're running on questions, so maybe we can switch through these. Yeah. No. Um, obviously, the, the, the major theme here is that I'm not presenting um, arguments for certain readings. I'm not talking about, you know, so that might be causing your eye to twitch. But again, this is, this is a theological position here. So, um, I'm going to, so I'm assuming things that maybe you aren't comfortable with uh, necessarily. Um, the text of the New Testament was far more centralized, I argue, than perhaps is commonly accepted. I think that has to be the case due to the uniformity that we see pop up later on in the, in the copying process. A vast number of Bibles, which originally could be bound in four volumes, we, we maybe know that that was the case, um, or know that that was the case, were destroyed in the Diocletian persecution around the time that our earliest surviving manuscripts are dated to, in that period of time. So I argue that since these earliest surviving texts do not represent the majority of the texts that appear later, at least in significant places, um, that we really, the difference between the modern critical text and the TR, significant places, um, since they do not ap agree with the texts that appear later in the manuscript tradition, Despite existing in a time where Bibles would have been more valuable than gold to the church, in a time when Bibles were being burned and, and, and uh, burned and everything taken from people that, that needed them, um, it doesn't seem that these texts were being directly copied. At least they didn't survive into the middle period in their exact form. Um, either you, they, Which ones are you talking about? That Alexandrian texts. Just the, those weren't copied later? Um, in terms of... Uh, <coughs> well, Is that what you're saying or well, usually the, the, what I've heard, perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, is that, that the Byzantine is, is distinct enough to where the point it either evolved from the Alexandrian and Western or Caesarian, or some, sometimes they say it went that way, or it represented a different text stream. But I, I, don't, I would say that you can argue that they, they don't come from each other in terms of, of um, direct lineage, right? You wouldn't argue for a genealogical connect between Byzantine and Alexandrian, right? No, I think that's actually what people would argue. Oh, they would argue that. Okay, maybe you can, you can enlighten me later afterwards. Okay. Um, so, so uh, okay, so I won't go further on that point then. So I argue, then regardless of whether or not that last point was correct, I argue that the true text of Scripture was faithfully copied and transmitted by ham, hand up to the time of the printing press and the fall of Constantinople leading up to the Protestant Reformation and the Humanist Renaissance. So the copies used by the first effort of creating printed Greek texts represented generally by the original text of the New Testament um, were the ones that were preserved. So I believe that what they had 
during the time of the first printed editions was the original text of the New Testament. And for this, I provide a basic proof theologically. One, the Bible was materially preserved in every generation. Two, if the Bible was preserved materially in every generation, that means it was preserved up to the invention of the printing press and use thereof. Three, therefore, the manuscripts used during the 16th century represent that preserved text, assuming the church wasn't completely oblivious to the text that was being used and had been used up to that point. So the alternative view, I argue, introduce a messy reality that we simple, simply will never know what the originals said. So either the church had it very, very wrong for hundreds and hundreds of years, that is to say that either God stopped speaking to his church or he let them go blind during the greatest Christian revival in the history of the world, or the text that was received during this time was in fact God's very own text. So regardless of whether or not that text came from Alexandria or, or developed or whatever, the, the text that they used was used significantly by God for the next, I mean, still today, significantly used by God. So a text that was settled, completed, and agreed upon by the Protestant world, the only critics of this text were Rome and other heretics. This is evidenced by all the translations, commentaries, theological works, and so forth, there really was not another text, despite the fact that all of the reforms commenting on textual criticism make mention of many of the hotly discussed variants that we still discuss today. It is sometimes said that this cannot be the case due to the lack of ecumenical counsel um, deciding the text of the church, but this is exactly what makes this historical reality so compelling. The lack of, the count of a council demonstrates that apart from ecumenical authority, a single text of scripture was adopted by the Protestant world. So the lack of diversity in the text during this time is so apparent that you guys have probably heard it being called the default text by James White. Oh, well, there was no other text, so they had to, that was the only one they had. And I think that speaks to the uniformity of the text they had at that time, as well as to the time up to that point that the churches were actually using, and they would have had perspective on the text that they were using, especially with all the bishops coming over from Constantinople, the fall of Constantinople, and their Bibles. Translation, and, and so the idea of, of providence doesn't stop at the Reformation. And it doesn't start there either. No, right, correct. Translations of this text still occupy, according to some recent research that was done, the majority of the market for people who actually read their Bible today. I think the number is somewhere around 50-55% of people who read their Bible daily read a King James. In English. In, in English, English. And I imagine that that number probably translates pretty well to other countries too. Yeah, it's even higher. Than not, not necessarily, yeah, it's, it's even uh, higher with the Riena of Valera and everything like that. Well, yeah. I mean, they don't read the King James in China. Right, but they read a, a TR translation, Masoretic oh, text. Yeah, yeah. And that's something Edgar talks about in his chapter, right? mm. the, how and why the translators use what they use. So. Right, yeah. Okay. So what that tells me today, it tells a story that despite other options now being available, that text is still the text that is most used and received by God, even over some of the newer options that might be easier to read. That is not to say that people who do not read translations from the, the, the traditional text are not the people of God or they're not saved or anything like that. Just that the majority of people who do read their Bibles seem to read from traditional text by, um, translations. So the argument from God's providence does not start or stop in the 17th and 16th centuries. We can trace it up today. During the time of Westcott and Hort, we know that a revision effort was taken on that actually created an entirely new text, I would argue, a different text form on a macro level that excluded the ending of Mark, the Pericope Adultere, 1 John 5, 7, it was a different shaped text, so to speak. A number of verses not in it, or at least bracketed and footnoted. Um, and I argue that this was providential. Rather than the traditional text changing in the 19th century, it stayed the same. So while the new text continued to change and still continues to change today, um, the, the newer text has been evolving essentially since West Cotton Fort. We, even if those changes are minor, you know, we're not saying that, that it's necessarily huge changes, but it has been changes and is still changing and undecided. So for 400 years now, one text has been, has been the same and the other has been changing. But you did admit there's a difference between TR editions. Yes, yes, of course, yeah. But you mean it's changing more? Yes, yeah, right, right, right. So the other idea is that, that at one point people stopped working on the TR. They said, this is, this, this is the general TR tradition. This is the text platform. Most right? of the TR have differences. Right, yeah, no, I'm not saying there's one TR. Okay. 
which you asked that question, which TR? I have that noted. We'll talk about that after. Yeah, we'll talk about that, yeah. So ultimately, I think the decision for the people of God is not difficult when it comes to choosing a text. In my opinion, you have two options, essentially. Now, obviously, you can consider the majority text, but no one has ever used the majority text ever, as far as we can tell, at least in printed editions. No one has ever used that in the church, unless you wanted to take the, the, the perhaps the Eastern Orthodox text as a majority text, if you want to call that. Yeah, so um, in terms of like uh, Farstad, Hodges and Farstad, like that kind of thing. The, the American evangelical version of the majority text argument, right? Not necessarily the Eastern Orthodox Church, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I needed to clarify that. Um, so I think that there are basically two options. You have a TR type text, which I would argue even the Eastern Church's text is a TR type text. Um, I don't know if you might disagree with that on, on me on that one, but I... I, I, I mean, it depends. It's all comes down to how you define terms. How you define the TR and what that is. Okay, so we're just going to take a, the, the general text platform, the shape at a macro level I mean, of the, the TR. The problem yeah. is the danger is saying the yeah. TR is whatever I accept as okay. Sure. Yeah, maybe and we can nuance that. Nothing can ever challenge that, right? So it's like right. we have some fixed definition of it so we know right. your position is actually. Sure, yeah, yeah. Maybe we can maybe talk about that after. So if, if we consider basically two types of text, you have the TR type and the modern critical type, which generally follow all F and B for the most part in the places that they differ in big places. Um, so you have a TR type and you have an all F and B sort of type. So one of these texts has been stable for 400 years or more. And one of these texts has been changing for 400 years or more, or I'm sorry, since the 19th century, not 400 years for about 200 years. And, and this, I believe, is, is a very good indication that God is not providentially working at a changing text. So ultimately, adherence to the traditional text is a matter of receiving the text that most comports with the three theological principles I laid out. One, is the text preserved or is it under construction? I argue that these two principles are at odds with each other. One text is finished, the other is not. Two, is the text delivered or is it being delivered? One text is stable, the other is changing. Three, is the text self-authenticating or must the text be authenticated by text critical means which do not take into consideration, especially, as Beza said, the kind consideration of the church. One text was received by the consent of the people of God and its overwhelming adoption, use, and use. The other has not really been uniformly received by anybody, at least in a stable form. I don't know of any scholars who uniformly agree on every single reading hand in hand and say this is the text. But that's not true. Um, well, I mean, I, I mean, in terms of how we define the T, the, but that's the T, really rather a TR right? Quote. Well, if, if we're defining the confessional text position, which I'm laying out, then I would say we, we generally agree, or at least exactly agree, and step yeah, and step. Wilson holds it to a yeah. different TR than you. No, he doesn't. He says the Stephanus 1550. He said that rhetorically, though. Well, I think he did. Rhetorically. Okay. Well, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Regardless, yeah. would yeah. it matter if he did? Not necessarily. I think, I think since I've laid out two different kinds of camps within our position, and I know you're, I know you're smiling because you, but like you, 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 know, you generally have more problems than I do in explaining the same exact question, right? But, you, but see, yeah. the, yeah. issue, the question is because you just made it, you, you allowed no exceptions in what you just said. Can you just reread it again? Maybe? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, so is, this, is the text self-authenticating or, or must the text be, self, or but be authenticated by text critical means? which do not take into consideration the kind consideration of the church as was defined by Beza. Yeah, thank you, Sorry. Yeah, Keep okay. So what I will thank say, you. that the use and reception of the TR as is usually accepted, the readings of the King James are typically um, what's, what's called the TR by people, but we can talk about that, whether or not that's warranted. Hills argued that the King James represents a form of the TR because it was taken from TR readings. Um, mm -hmm that for the next, the high orthodox period, the confessional period, the Puritan era, there was general uniform agreement on just about every single reading in, in this corpus of te this text corpus. And so you can look at theological con uh, commentaries, you can look at theological works, you can look at the translations that were made, not just the English one, and see the, the, the almost exact uniformity amongst them all. And so obviously we could go and find a collation yeah, of all that. Yeah, as far as, well, and there's, um, I think the Dutch Strata Vertaling has, um, has like one there's like one difference, so, so I wouldn't say, so there might be one, it's like one, or two. it's like one or two different readings, it might take, um, 
I, I, I couldn't, they're not exact, yeah, exactly. It takes, it takes uh, a somnos. A somnos over osios yeah. in Revelation 16, five. okay. So, um, so the essential idea here, and then one of the biggest critiques I have towards, and, and one of the biggest motivators I have for adopting the traditional text, is that there is not one unified modern text that anybody in the Protestant world seems to agree on. And so even within the TR, the amount of significant differences, Hill's argued for like eight of them. And, and, and so are we dealing with eight variants or are we dealing with hundreds? But doesn't the 1% equals 100% principle hmm. make rid of that irrelevant? I would, eight, eight differences hmm. is equivalent to 800 differences on that, on that ground. Well, no, That's and I would say that if you look at the commentaries from the pre-modern period and the Reformation period and post-Reformation period, you see how they determine a, a decision on a textual variant, what they do. And I would say in my personal experience with just reading my Bible, and reading commentaries, there is not a single place where I don't know what the text says. I would say the same thing about the text I have in my back. Right, but you would throw out some of the readings that I don't throw out. Right, yeah, exactly. But, what I, yeah. but I'm not, but I'm not holding to a, a to a one percent variation means that I can't accept anything, which is the position you held that one one percent of this uncertainty is equivalent to one hundred percent uncertainty. So right. you just told me that there are at least eight under Hill's position variances within the TR. Which whether right. that had achieved one percent, I don't know. So sure. I say it's uncertain. Is that an issue or no? I would argue no because there are uh, the 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 way that I explain this is you, you're talking about one percent, one hundred percent, right? This yeah, idea. Yeah, this is the this is the guideline which you laid out. This is what this is what I often critique modern critical text proponents of doing, where you give them an inch on a variant and they will take a mile and throw out forty verses of the Bible. But we're not the ones oh, but creating the right. issue. Right. See, our position yeah. is fine with yeah. uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, You're yeah. Saying uncertainty. I'm, I'm asking you to measure right. your standard right. against your TR. Against my TR? Yeah. Your TR against your own principle. In other words, if some uncertainty is very bad, or I should say again, if any uncertainty is I'm, bad. I'm kind of, I'm a little bit lost. I'm turned around a little bit right now where we've been talking about that. Well, you can do it. I won't. That way it'll Well, let's pause here and just say, okay, we're pause. Okay. Uh, how much do you have left? I have basically my conclusion in my application, my personal reason and pastoral reasons. Okay, so I do want to do Q&A, is that okay? Yes, yes, I'm already out of time. Well, so we need to end at 8. Uh, 15 we have 15 minutes. 15 minutes? So I would love to okay. have 15 minutes of Q&A, but I don't want to cut you off if, if there's something else important that you need to say. I'd like to, to give his last point. But you, 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 well, you have a... You have your personal reasons. I would like to. I'd can like you give okay. us a short version? Yes, I can. Okay, okay. I mean, so. I don't want to prevent you from doing that. Yeah, sure. Part, part, we had it for a few So um, I think that. I think my pastoral reasons are probably way more important and more personal, powerful. There's a strong pastoral case, I believe, to, to make for retaining the traditional text, regardless of if you take issue with the 1%, 100% axiom that I presented. You may take problems with that. But I think there is a strong pastoral case for retaining the traditional text, which many people that I've talked to have found very compelling, regardless of textual criticism, the textual discussion. Many pastors who are not familiar with the textual issues retain the traditional text for these reasons. The first is that the Bible, I mean, the Bible that is translated from the traditional text and used primarily from the traditional text is not changing. It's not changing, which means the text you preach from, hopefully for many, 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 many years in your pastoral ministry, is not going to change. Which means that you're not going to have to preach on the same passage, the same verse, in two different texts in the course of your ministry. Which is very, very likely that will happen with ECM. And with ESV. <laughs> right. So there's a, there's a strong case regardless of the textual discussion on having a stable text. Um, secondly, your congregation is not going to raise their eyebrow when the text you're, cha- you're preaching from is changing. Um, and I know that we say that, that a lot of people don't have a problem with this, but I know for a fact a lot of people have a problem with this. I know people who, their Bible changing. I know people who do not read their Bible anymore because it's changing. And they don't want to accept our position. They basically would, they would rather not read their Bible than read a King James because of the rhetoric, for example, of, um, with as much grace as I can say, of, of people like Mark Ward and James White. They would rather not read a Bible than read a King James. Why would they just read the New King James? Well, because if it's, you know, it's, it's the same kind of thing, the same modern idea. They, they don't. 
I know people that do read the New King James. Usually, majority text people read the New King James, so that's typically because it has the majority. They're just concerned about they don't want their Bible changed. That's why right. just adopt the Bible well, and read well, the whole way. Well, the New well, yeah, of course, but what? But then it gets to the point where you've got the, the the letters of your Bible are the same as the letters on the person next to you, but there's different. And that happened to us when we were when we planted Agro's Church. Yeah, we had a yeah, we had a 2001, a 2007, a 2000, yeah, you know, 16. Yeah, we had, we, we had three different ESVs in our congregation, and it was problematic. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a that's a that's a big reason that people retain the King James at least, and the and in theory other traditional text Bibles. Um, the second reason is that your your congregation, the people that you're actually ministering to and loving and preaching to, um, are going to have the same text their whole lives. You can assure their, your congregation, even, I guess, if you want to say it's the wrong word of God, they're going to have the same word of God their whole life. Um, and uh, one quick point on that. I mean, I cannot tell you how many small groups, Bible studies I have been in that have been disrupted by, turned into complete chaos and confusion by somebody who thought they knew something about textual criticism, had a different Bible version in their hands than everyone else, and decided to beat people over the head with some rhetoric they learned on the dividing line. Well, I'll just throw out there that I was told by an elder at a church that I was speaking at that because I didn't use the King James, he was taking his family out of the church and I better not come back. There are, right. there are, so it goes both ways. It, it, exactly. It, it just oftentimes it's painted. I mean, for example, um, James White paints us in his book as church wreckers and people that go into congregations to steal and destroy. That's how he paints us. But in, but. The only reason that division exists is because of, we, 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 I mean, I hate to use this argument, but we came first. The King James was the one that came first. So who causes, who causes the problem? The little brother or, or the one that was born first? The one that comes onto the scene and kicks the, the, all the china off the shelf? And, At one um, point, though, the King yeah. James was. You no 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 no. No, I don't. I don't. Geneva Bible was no. The King James was produced in order to overturn the Geneva. Yeah. Right? Yes, of course. Well, and the, and the way this is typically told by I, I think not so honest scholars or pseudo scholars is is that that the King James introductory note argues for fifty thousand different translations that we think we should translate a million different English Bibles. There were there was a bunch of Bibles made up to that point and even used as exemplars up to the King James. Um, and those were the versions they were talking about, which generally agreed with the King James readings and translational choices. And do, you, so, do you think the preface mm -hmm. of King James uh, itself recognizes that it can be improved? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and, and we even recognize right. that it can be. We can even. Right. Yeah, right, right. right. Just, I think there'll be a time that it needs yeah. to be improved. Yeah. Then there's even people now that are like, "It's too archaic. We need to work on a new translation." But when yeah. it does yeah. need to be improved at some point, your two arguments there will be invalidated. Is that right? What's that? The ones you just made, the fact about wanting to have an addition that never changes. Well, and, and that would be, I mean, that's, I don't think we'll ever get there. I think, I think we're more likely to see the English language devolve to where people have to read it. I mean, I don't think we have any really a group of scholars alive that could do the kind of translation work that, that the, the scholars did um, back then. So it may need so, to be done at some point. It may need to be, in theory, yeah, hypothetically. Be, so like, it, what Hill says about it, you can read about it. In the yeah, what Hill's about basically about said, yeah. On the, on the, it's a section on the authorized version, it's toward yeah. the end, I forget the exact, I don't know, exact page. Right. Exactly right there he, you know, the argument he lays out about when there is a need for a new, yeah. or what do you do about archaic words. Yeah. Can, I, right. can I keep going? I don't know. Yeah, I'm almost done here, then yeah, we, can, we can interact. So, finally, the final point, I mean, in theory, it's not going to change. Hypothetically, they're, they, they could come and redo it, but in theory, it's not like going to change. Injection. What's that? It's like injection. In theory, I'm happy with it. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So finally, when you retain the traditional text, you stand in direct lineage with the forefathers of the Protestant religion. Their exegesis, the texts they used, the statements are all built on, in many cases, texts that are no longer in modern Bibles. And as this is, this is true. Doctrinal points are built on verses that are not in the modern critical text. If you look at and my proof text is the fact that there are many verses in here that just aren't in the modern critical text that they build entire doctrinal statements on. Would you say that they were built only on those verses? Could be. I mean, so what's our word, what's our word, where does our word from in, for inspiration come from? My question would be, are you, are you, is your position that a, do, say a doctrine of scripture is reliant on a single text? Of it can be, yeah. So yeah. Which, which doctrine of scripture is reliant on one verse? That's inspiration. Not, inspiration is reliant on one verse? Yes. And how? In the fact that that's the only time that word is used. 
You mean the first the English word inspiration used in the Greek text? Okay. No, he means he the, means the, the Okay, but the Omnistos doesn't mean inspiration. It means God. But you're you're not actually depends on how you translate it. But, but you're not actually suggesting that the whole doctrine of inspiration is built. On I'm just saying this 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 but idea that, that doctrines proof have proof. multiple proof texts in every circumstance. There's, I mean, I the, there are some that don't. Yes, okay. I, I think that that there is there there are definitely cases where, um, unless you're arguing from good and necessary consequence, of course. Where, where, you, where, you, where, you, where you're deducing doctrine in other places, but I'm talking about necessary, explicitly set forth in Scripture. There are certain times where we, for example, Jesus is preaching to the souls in prison. Is there a doctrine based on that? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. If you go into a systematic theology, what in the world does that mean? Well, no, what, doc, what Christian doctrine is based on that verse? Um, I mean, what, what happened to Jesus when he, when he descended? Well, he descended to hell. Yeah. That's not based just Okay, maybe we can talk about that later, but, but I mean, I, there, is there another place in Scripture that talks about that? Sure, the descent into hell. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's the whole issue is, is Holy Saturday, right? What happens between yeah. death and the resurrection? Yeah, do you have another proof text for that? I wouldn't look for a proof text. I would look for, the, I would look for other passages that speak about there being a gap between the two, right? And so, the, so there's no other... No, there's a whole book that just came out that's not based on that verse. Oh, maybe maybe I'm confusing what I'm saying here. Look at look up the yeah. um, what's his name Matt Emerson. Yeah, it's Emerson's book. Yeah, I look at Matt Emerson's book. That it's certainly not based on that verse. Well, okay. Obviously, there are certain texts that okay. are important. Right? But, yeah. Okay. So the, the the essential point that I'm making, and, and this is the difference between modern exegesis and historical exegesis, in that modern exegesis tends to say we don't build doctrine on variants, we don't build doctrine on contested passages, we. Um, use the, the whole corpus of a text to determine the meaning of it. And, 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 and that's not, in essence, wrong, right? But uh, I think it's different. I think it's very different. They, they, they used to be comfortable establishing doctrines on one verse, um, at least using them as proof text without having to say, we can't use this for a proof text. We well, want sure, to keep it here. The issue is, what is a proof text? And what do they mean by that? Sure, they yeah. They didn't build their entire doctrine on a proof text. They meant... Right. Here's this doctrine that is true from all scripture, and here is one scripture that encapsulates that whole thing. Sure, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, from. yeah. That's I, would, I, would, I, would, I would agree with that. In other words, they never would have said, we can't have that doctrine without that. So, so you would say that... that, that, that well, an exception maybe, though, um, for Sean 5, that obviously, right? Which right, yeah, yeah. Straight. So that, that's all I, that, I mean, the, 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 the summation of that point is essentially you stand and can use the same text that the Protestants used. That's the, that's the general idea of it, and, and that's it's. So those three reasons is that your text is not going to change. You you can um, it's it's quite a pastoral tool. I've I've actually been able to um, dissuade many people from having crises of faith due to the fact that they're like, oh, this Bible is not going to change. And and I know a lot of people that would rather learn to read the archaisms than memorize a text that's changing, or build doctrine on a text that's changing. They'd rather to learn the archaisms than. Then and learn, that's, yeah. that probably because they share your view of this whole issue. Not necessarily. I, I know people that are kind of in a... I mean, implicitly, they don't necessarily mean like they worked it out. Some people that we know are more so like, I, I don't necessarily agree with you, but I don't agree with what they're doing in Munster. And that's, that's a lot of Is people. That's a choice. <laughs> yeah. That's, 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 yeah. Do they know about Cambridge? Can you know <laughs> well, is that, being trans is that being translated by anyone? Why does it need to be? Because no one knows Creek. But is it that different than what's in the ESV? I mean, I, they uh, monogamous eos is in it, right? Mon monogamous quios. Uh, that's that's the they use um, only only God, right? It's only God, I think. They, they don't even translate Yanis. They don't even translate uh, Yanis. They just translate mono. No, no, no. no. Yeah. They're, they're, that's how they're translating. Yeah. Oh, they that's. Just, they just take it as mono. No, this, no, this is a. This is a that's a very big, huge. This is a matter of interpretation, not text criticism. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So, so they, they, but it is a different reading. They take um, Tyndall House does take quios instead of the, theos, theos there. Yeah. So there are differences. There, there, there I are. I say there were differences. I'm yeah. just saying if yeah. the choice is between the TR and the ECM, that's a false choice. You it's significant. That's it. Yeah, there's middle of a row. Well, I mean, you can do the SBL edition if you want that. You can do the Tyndale edition if you want that. So how are you defining, like, when, when it comes to a Bible that people read, how are you defining that? Like, is, is there a Bible? 
Meaning like a translation based on like like it, like is like an is 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 an ESV a Bible? Yes. In what sense? In the only sense that matters. That it is God's word. Yeah. See, uh, so here's the difference. I think. Yeah. Now clarify if I'm wrong. Yeah. For me, a Bible is not to be every single word that God inspired before it's a Bible. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Do you, do you disagree with that? No, because there. I mean, we know in the early church they had probably four volumes that circulated. So is is the the copy that had the Gospels is that a Bible? Is you know what makes something a Bible? So I get. I'm not, I'm not necessarily arguing for that, but at what point you know you're saying, well, we have all these options: the SBL, the Tyndale House, um, the NA28. You I'm know. saying if you're worried that like I can't wait for the ECM folks to finish their job. By the way, it's not just ministry now, right? But, I can't wait for them to finish their job. To have South a Africa involved now? No. No. Oh. So. Nice. I can't wait for ECM to finish. Right. Right. Well, that's fine. People have been printing Greek testaments for you know. Well, so yeah, no, well, what I'm get, I guess what I'm getting at is like let's just say you disagree with the methodology behind the the Nestle Alon platform. Yeah, perfect. So go with the Tindo. How would you access that if you only sp uh, read English, for example? How would you Basically access that? The same things in your ESV already, or your NASB. It's not that different. I'm not sure what. How, how different do you think they are? Okay, so. Can I, can I tap in? Yeah, yeah, yeah tap in. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, Okay, so like, you know, you know, there's, I'm not recommending that people do this, but people don't know Greek or whatever, they get an interlinear, they're all stuck. Mm. You could make a interlinear Tyndale ESV. It wouldn't sure. line up. No, I mean, in, in a lot of places, most yeah, places, right. right, there would be some changes, right? So I think, I mean, if you're going to print a text platform and then propagate that text platform, even if it differs a little bit, the NIV did this, it doesn't use any of the major text platforms. It uses, you know, that little Zondervan readers? That's that's their underlying Greek text. So they actually made some different choices. It's, well, it's all translations do that. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, but basically, yeah. you can get one that's less why they can do it in your linear. Or they might have no sure. Or something. But you know the reason why they did that, right? What the NIV? Yeah. I think it's copyright issues. Copyright? Yeah. Oh, nice. But and now that's actually that's actually a big uh, reason I know people rejecting a lot of the modern Bibles too. They don't like the industrial complex about it all. Yeah. But, but yeah, my, my, my point yeah. is. My, my point is, yeah. if you're going to have a, a Greek text platform, I don't think there's anything wrong. If, if you're going to say, hey, this is another option, yeah. it should be an option to them in that language. Right. Which, if there's people that can translate, translate. But here, even if the differences guess, are not all that, that, here's that my different. Point, the ECM yeah. hasn't been translated into English either. You said you feel like right, you right. choose between the King James and Moose. We're saying people feel that way. People feel, people feel that way. ECM hasn't been translated, that's not even an option. For well, where does the NA28 come from, right? It's, it's, no, it's, that hasn't been translated either. That's my point. So, uh, it doesn't exist either the way that you're saying. So the ESV, the ESV, it's when in, 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 but that's what people they're they're waiting. They don't have anything. They're saying that that's that's the dichotomy that people see, like and awesome. they're going, okay, so what do I do? Why would why would you need to wait for them to finish? That's the mindset. That well, because most of us are having to deal. With. We, yeah, be, uh, I I think I know why, and it comes from your book. Read my book. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I didn't even talk about it. I talk about it. I didn't talk about it. So I, I think that, that maybe um, this statement right here on page six of your book, clearly these changes will affect not only modern Bible translations and commentaries, but possibly even theology and preaching. Will. Right. But not may have. So are we, when, when you read, it's like Schrodinger's Bible. Are you reading a dead Bible right now? Explain that. I do like that term. Sure, do you have Schrodinger's Bible? Yeah. The cat yeah. is either dead or alive in the box until you open it. Oh, right. essentially. So, so it could be both at the same time. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's actually right. Yeah, and that, that's that's the kind of the problem. So like, if, if the text is gonna change and and according. But when you say the text, what the, just the text that people read. What people? The people of God. But they're already reading the Bible, aren't they? Well, maybe not. No, but they are. Well, according to you, the just Bible's going to change. But just because no, 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 just because the edition changes doesn't mean yeah. the word of God has changed. Why are you why are you why are you mm -hmm. waiting an edition made by people in Germany with the Bible? When did the Germans get to start determining what the Bible was for God's people? Because I'm not defining the Bible in such vague terms that you can't throw a dart through it. Do you let me ask you this way? Do you think that um, people take a reason eclectic view are bound to what they do for the ECM? No. No, not That's at all. Kind of That's kind of the problem, though. Because eventually they will. They should be? Well, what do you not mean they will be? They will be. No, no, I said that that's also one of the, the problems that I see is it's kind of like build a Bible at that point. Yeah, right. I, that's what I did when I used the. But uh, like you just sold my ECM in my office, right? Yeah, 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 yeah right, 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 right. 
Yeah, I mean, the concept is cool. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's an impressive feat. Well, I mean, but that's like the recording data that's in manuscripts, right? Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's a database. Yeah, and what's the problem with that? I'm not saying there's a problem. They're not saying there's a problem. In practice, people, yeah. when I used the critical text, yeah. and I went to preach, yeah. I chose the readings. Right. Looking at mm -hmm. commentaries, textual commentaries, yeah. Yeah. like the comfort. And, and you didn't like how to make that decision. Huh? And you didn't like how to make that decision. I mean, I think, it's, yeah, it's kind of an, an it's uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, yeah okay. but, but I think it's a problem that every Christian's <laughs> left up to that. And I know we can, you know, talk about the, the TR, the 12 places. Yeah. But we're talking about the difference between the two platforms. I think that was Pastor Taylor's point earlier was you have over here, mm -hmm. since West Scott Horror, obviously before that, Tregelius and stuff a little bit. But we're talking mostly the past late 1800s okay. forward. Okay. Uh, even John Mill noted stuff, but he wasn't throwing things out. We have in entire portions of scripture missing. Mm -hmm. Large chunks of scripture missing. Beyond, Plus, beyond Mark and ending in John. Yeah, those are big okay. portions of scripture. I'm not saying it's everywhere, okay. but we have two massive like portions of scripture. One, yeah. one that, right. one that is the gospel, mm -hmm. and then one that's yeah. you know just a, a story about Jesus and the woman. There's still scripture. Right. My point is that you have those two things, and there's mm -hmm. all sorts of other problems there or variants. I'm not maybe mm -hmm. not problems. It's just other variants and stuff yeah. that are cast out, whatever. And then you have. The TR, where we're talking about 12 places, 12 real places, where we're talking about the difference between Osios or Somanos. Right. Neither, are, neither change doctrine, whereas Mark 16 changes tons of doctrine. The ascension of Christ, the right hand of Christ uh, to the right hand of God. Oh, if you lose right. that, if you lose that, you don't have that doctrine in the Gospels. You only have it one other time. Well, no, you don't have that doctrine in the Gospel of Mark explicitly in that place. You don't have that you in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke and John. You don't have any the ascension to the right hand of God. If you, if you lose the ending of Mark, you lose the Gospel message that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I, I just said he, the ascension to the right hand and of God. And that is an essential part of the Gospel that you can't find anywhere else. I said that part, that doctrine, yes, the ascension of the right hand of God. You don't find yes. that anywhere else in the New Testament? No, you do. I said about the Gospel. This is, this is a historical well, argument what, that's been made for is, hundreds of years. It's confusing yeah. how losing that part of Mark somehow means that you couldn't find that in Hebrews. Well, here, here's my point. With the two different text platforms, one we're talking about, is it holy or shall it be? The other one we're talking about, the ascension okay. of Christ to the right sure, hand of God. Sure. Well, we understand that, but I guess, sure. do, you, do you see, though, that we're not, we have not, the established principle that was laid out in this presentation was that any uncertainty, not how big of an uncertainty, but any uncertainty means it's invalid. Therefore, any uncertainty in the TR, regardless of if, if it's a minor one in Revelation or if it's the longer ending Mark, mm -hmm. should, on that principle, render the TR just as questionable as the you know, right. That's text. not that's not the main view of TR. But that's right. the principle. No, yeah, that's from, not. From, no. what, from that's what we're asking. How is this not inconsistent? That wasn't my argument that I just made, but it is. See, this is, we're operating under the principle that was laid out. One percent. Mm -hmm. Uncertainty equals one hundred percent uncertainty in principle. Huh? I think the, therefore, if you're telling me, but then your response was yes, but the only uncertainties in the TR are minimal. The argument is not about whether the uncertainty is minimal or whether it's maximal. Well, let's, let's it's about that. whether it exists. Yes, let's ask that as a question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yes. the word of Hills talks about maximum certainty, right? Meaning well, not complete certainty, maximum certainty. So in those twelve places, yeah. even he had issues with First John five seven. He did. Yeah. So do you? You know. I don't know. Okay. So. This, but this goes back to the question I brought up, right? Mm -hmm. How much certainty is essential? I, I think when it comes down, to answer your question, um, I, I, th I think absolute certainty when you're reading your Bible, I think is extremely important. And what, what is absolute certainty? It mean? means when I read the words, I know that they're God's word. Okay, but you may not know yeah. what they mean. Well, that's just speaking to my English comprehension. I'm not a great reader. No, no, no I, mean, <laughs> I mean interpretation. I mean interpretation, like, you know, yeah. reading about Jesus preaching. Yeah, I think that's two different categories. Two different categories. Category. Yeah, but, right, right, right. Okay, so yeah. so you're yeah. totally comfortable with more uncertainty in this category than this other one. Is that what you're? Of course, I mean, sure. Yeah, as yeah. Christians, we have to be. Or yeah. else, would be different denominations. Well, no, I don't think so. I think some people are as certain in their interpretations as you are in your textual view. No, so I'm, I'm saying hmm. that's my point. Is yeah. that's why there's different denominations. Yeah, but, but we all we all believe yeah. that there's different interpretations of things. Yeah, but that's also right, right. There's different texts as well. Right, but hermeneutics. And yeah. textual criticism in two different categories. No, I agree. I, I, I totally agree. Right, right. That's and I also right. think that, that... What's not different, mm. though, is whether uncertainty is acceptable or not. In, in the matter of text, yeah. it's his point. 
I and I, and I, I would say that the no, kind no. of uncertainty that you guys are talking about is categorically different than the kind of uncertainty we are talking about. And see, that's, I think that's the issue, right? Yeah. For us, it's numerically different. Right. And for you, the numerical difference itself, itself is categorically different. And, and my question for you yeah. is, how many places of uncertainty hmm. does one get to before it becomes categorically different? Is it yeah. 10, 20? That's, that's a good question. But that's actually something that I... It seems I've, like an yeah. essential question. Well, that, 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 that honestly, it doesn't seem, so typically we get this question, which TR, how do you determine, you know, well, if there's one variant, there's a million, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, the, it's the argument that I call with, you know, without being offensive, the Bible, I can't have a Bible, so neither can you argument. That's, that's the kind of argument it seems like. 